He's been a national finalist in multiple poetry slam competitions and was the recipient of both the 2016 Sustainable Arts Foundation grant and the 2018 Spirit of Columbus Foundation grant. The Kalalu and Watering Hole Fellow is the author of three poetry collections and currently lives with his family in Columbus. He's an MFA candidate at Randolph College of Newspaper. And we're really thrilled too that Omar was able to make it out from Brooklyn for this event. Um, this is the only in-person event that they're doing for the book. Uh, and so we feel really fortunate that you guys put it in the time and effort to not only write a book, but then to share it with us here. Uh, Omar Holman lives as he writes one nerd reference at a time. Yeah. Recognized by Rutgers University as a distinguished alumni poet. <laughs> He's the author of the poetry collection, We Were All Someone Else Yesterday. I wrote that. Oh, it wasn't that book, that was the Nick's editor. Yeah! Got the genius at my shit. Who's that? Who's that? And he's co-founder of the website Black Nerd Problems. Omar's voice is one that makes a home across numerous demographics. <laughs> like a beautiful mind with yeah. more <laughs> Read that. <laughs> <laughs> Read that. <laughs> like a beautiful mind, but with more comic book and movie books. <laughs> Omar is able to find a correlation between pop culture and anybody any body of work using humor in his social commentary to make serious points. He does that. <laughs> <laughs> so after the, the reading and discussion, Will and Omar are also willing to sign uh, copies of the book. We just ask that you wear your mask and respect everyone's uh, safe space, social distancing and whatnot. Um, we would also like to acknowledge that the land on which $2 Radio headquarters is located is the contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Miami, and Hopewell nations. We would like to pay our respects as well as honor the culture, heritage, and resiliency of these and other indigenous nations with strong ancestral ties to these lands, as well as individuals from indigenous backgrounds in our community who continue to call Central Ohio home. All right, let's get started. Thanks, guys. No problem, thank you. Oh, my goodness. How do you want to start this off? Oh, wait, what the fuck? We're supposed to, what? Yeah. Are we gonna read some shit? <laughs> no, why are you surprised? Why are you know me by now? Oh, you're supposed to be real. Yeah, I know that. I'm gonna jump right off it. Like, what do you want to read for? <laughs> you guys are oh, so surprised. This is me. You knew this was um, me. Um, this one's like a slide show. So, yeah. uh, I mean, really, I think the best place to start is the first thing to say is, I was in, I mean, I feel like they got it very good. Oh, you gotta send me out stuff, man. Get it up, man. Get it up, man. What, 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 you, want, you want an intro? You want me to give you an intro or something? Nah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You want, you want the, like the I've not been working on my WWE. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this is. Want. This is very like. This is very like, you know, like academic. This is me. This is academic in me. So you want to give them that first time? Right. We can do that. Anybody else? Alright. So we're going to read definition then. The first, we're going to start with the first chapter. Yes. Okay. I, I just, I just, I like this. I like this chapter to open the reading because one of the questions that we've gotten a lot about this book mm. is how do we categorize nerd? What, what, what makes nerd fashionable or mainstream more now than it was? I don't know, five years ago, ten years ago, whatever. Um, from the very stereotypical beginning of the past. And I just think Omar wrote a hell of a chapter in terms of introducing uh, readers into the world that we think of as nerds. So. Thank you. 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 Thank by Omar Holman, a.k.a. Noah Webster's Ghostwriter. Noah Webster, well, the Webster's <laughs> Dictionary. <laughs> Whatever, I'm fucking smart sometimes. Anyway, before we get into this real whack law of nerd essays and content, it's important to understand what we as authors mean when we refer to the term nerd. How we define the word may be different than how the reader defines it. So allow me to get my TED Talk monologue on to break the definition of the word nerd down by how it has come to be defined in dictionaries. 
takes off my regular square frame glasses, puts on my public speaking PowerPoint presentation for the shell frame glasses. <laughs> The online Merriam-Webster dictionary defines nerd as an unstylish, unattractive, or socially inept person, especially one slavishly devoted to an one slavishly devoted to intellectual or academic pursuit. Dictionary.com defines a nerd as one a person considered to be socially awkward, boring, unstylish, etc. Two, an intelligent but single-minded person obsessed with a non-social hobby or pursuit, a computer nerd. As words evolve, they go through semantic change, or more fittingly, semantic progression. Semantic progression occurs when the turn the pages here, modern meaning of a word is entirely different from its original meaning. Watch the breakdown. Watch the breakdown. Don't as a noun. You suggest refer to a secret person, 1850s. Later on in time, it became a reference to drugs, 1880s and 1900s. But as an adjective, it can refer to something as good or great, 1980s. You can think of countless other words that you've seen evolve via idioms and slang, which varies across cultures and ethnicities. One word that hasn't officially, as of me writing this in 2020, evolved in the dictionary is the term nerd. Now, you may be reading this and hearing this because they're an audio book and thinking, where's this going? Who gives a fuck? Why did he switch glasses when he was already wearing glasses? <laughs> Well, if you're reading this book that clearly says black nerd problems, or just glimpsing through it, Jeff Foxworthy voice, you might be a nerd. Regardless, hear me out and watch when I flip this shit. The only saving grace between both online dictionary descriptions in their second definition of the term, one slavishly devoted to an intellectual or academic pursuits, and an intent and an intelligent but single-minded person obsessed with a non-social hobby. Growing up in the 2000s from my teen to college years, I came to understand the term and had the term broken down to me as a person that knows a little bit about a lot of things, whereas a geek knows a lot about one specific thing. For me, and I want to say that for a lot of us that identify as nerds, this is a commonplace interpretation of the word, but as far as I know, I haven't ever seen that reflected on paper regarding the word in an official definition. I stated all that to say this. It's been a long time since the term nerd came into the context of a jock versus academic or the popular high school quarterback pushing a scrawny kid into a locker or the mean girls knocking books out of someone's hands. Now in 2020, it ain't really the revenge in the nerds movie setting for the context of the word. I'm hard pressed to say it ever was. And thank God, because even in that movie about underdog nerds trying to get their revenge, it's full of misogyny and racial stereotypes. Speaking of stereotypes, Media representation, media representation got to be factored into the description for a nerd as well, right? A nerd is usually a male, which is usually sexist, typically white, which is typically racist, scrawny or fat, but in a derogatory fatphobic way, that's, as we forget, on some obscure hobby slash thing no one else cares about. Sidebar. If you're reading this and want to say Steve Urkel from Family Matters as a brink of the mold by being the first mainstream black nerd, I question why Urkel, who debuted in 1989, Gets that credit and not Dwayne Lane from a different world who was a fucking mathematician and debuted two years before Urkel. Dwayne Lane and Irv Urkel are both nerds. Yeah. A lot of the kids got really excited. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Dwayne Lane and Steve Urkel were both nerds. The only difference was Urkel played heavily on exaggerated stereotypes of a nerd. So, is a nerd only recognized as a nerd when it comes with a full package of stereotypes? Never mind that the nerdy character Roger, Raj Thomas from What's Happening debuted in 1976. Wouldn't he be both their OG? But I digress. <laughs> okay, so we got the origin slash etymology of the nerd down, right? Boom. Now dead all that. With the way the term has evolved and how it's been incorporated in mainstream media, nerd is much more than a singular person. It's a spectrum. Nerd has evolved more so into being a fan of a genre. Then, sorry, I'm spitting so much realness right here. Just trying to keep up. <laughs> Nerd has been called more so to being a fan of a genre. That genre doesn't have to just be comic books, movies, sneakerheads are fans of sneakers and know how and know them in explicit detail. They can be considered nerds. Hip hop heads who know the entire history of the music genre can be considered nerds, academic nerds, cooking show nerds. Sports fans are most deaf nerds by being able to recount a player's performance statistics like an RPG character. The list goes on. If you enjoy something, anything you want, if it excites you and you want other people to know of it and enjoy it, then you're a fan of it, which also means you're a fucking nerd for it. Here's a place to stop, right? <laughs> Um, 
Two, I had a lot of time to think about what I was going to read next. I don't know what I'm going to read next. Um, I guess reading, you know, or can I suggest, can I suggest a piece? Well, you suggest, I don't know if I want to. I hate you so much. I'm glad there's a public space to say. <laughs> People see the way you treat me. <laughs> What, 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 what do you got? I didn't have, I was giving you time to think of something. No, I was actually going to say, uh, I mean, you know my two favorites, and you're a, you're a wire man yourself. Oh, how many people in here watch The Wire? Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I um, you know what I'm operating tonight? I never thought every single interview asked me. Oh, yeah! You're every single, I know, I mean, I know, you know what what every single interview asked me about the symbol I said. And, like, I, I mean, I don't know. I'll say what I'll say. I don't know what... <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what you want me to do. Okay, so this is actually a short piece. Um, but it was it was all my heart. I'm trying to... What mm-hmm. page is this? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I felt like this, this one came out of the fever dream. But... Uh, this is uh, Bury the Stringer Bell, but let E just live. Um... So if, you, if, you, if you've seen The Wire, then I don't need any other intro to it. Um, it says, by me, aka the dude that knows where the fuck Wallace is. All praise due to Idris, fine as you want to be. Every man, and I do mean every goddamn man, cussing his own genetic makeup because Idris. Got more jobs than, got more jobs than that black woman still ain't paid for the emotional labor. Got more talent than a bored ass Jamie Foxx after the show got canceled. Dude canceled the apocalypse of Pacific Rim, then got COVID-19 and canceled that shit for set himself too. Idris, never change. Never stop having a Madonna moment. Your marrying beauties have your age, even though you look three fifths of your age and damn self. <laughs> but it's time to admit that string of bell. Yes, that string of bell. Yes, that bell might have been the most beloved punk ass in TV history. String the destroyer. Stream the original Rock Nation brunch president. Stream the Sunday Truth Breaker was a terrible fucking person. And no, not the, well, he was a drug dealer. Of course he's a terrible, more high ground terrible. I mean, even on the wire, where there are no angels, he was still a lower demon terrible. Stream studied the game, watched the film, knew all his history, and still blew a 3-1 lead. Stream came up in a drug murder game and only bodied his own people. Sexy ass Judas, chicken hawk black sheep in wolf clothing, tropic, tropic, tropic chocolate thunder. He is the dude pretending to be the dude pretending to be another dude. He never won shit. Stringer Bell ain't won shit except a drug GQ magazine cover and some of come loud at a Baltimore community college. Show me a Stringer Bell accomplishment and I'll show you a nigga doing half a life sentence for his decision. String face two pretty pathetic tears. String will date your partner though. Let you take that bid and pipe your beloved. There's some homes in this house, the string is the home alone with no children. Stringer Bell is Mr. Steal Your Girl, or, correction, Stringer Bell is Mr. Let You Rot in the Jail Cell, Kill Your Underlings, and then Pay Someone to Murder You in Your Prison Library, Steal Your Girl. <laughs> you ain't seen the Angelo's kid string. You ain't taking that little nigga to Drew Hill Park. At least take him in as a war string. You ain't got no Ned Stark in you, bruh. West Baltimore looking like Iron Islands under your watch string. And how you gonna set up two of the most dangerous men in the game against each other? How you gonna work Robert's rules into the drug game? Does the chair know we look like some punk ass bitches string? How you gonna kill a kid because he no longer likes killing other kids string? How you obsessed with no paper trails but you run a copy machine business? How you let a downtown dude steal your money like that? How you gonna try and send your lead enforcer on a suicide mission because your feelings are hurt? How you ain't hard enough for this game string? How you not smart enough for this game string? You know why we love Dave on string? Because that man stood for something. Like, the entirely wrong shit, but he stood for something. <laughs> Avon didn't want nothing from nobody except his corners and maybe to drop some bodies on the block here and there. But the bodies were to remind people that those were his corners. What you ever stand for, String, besides to take an oath in court, besides to leave a prison visit when D'Angelo pumped you about Wallace, you know why we love Omar String? Because that man had a code. Don't know, don't never put your gun on nobody who wasn't in the game. What code did you have, String? 
Besides speaking in codes to make sure you weren't caught on tape talking that drug talk. Besides giving customers the code to use the copy machine in your store. <laughs> I'm sorry your string of bell was your favorite. I'm sorry we find Baltimore Benedict Arnold sex. Woo! I wish we had a, I wish he had a floating eye. I wish he had a hook for a hand, like a Captain Hook type metal appendage covered in smallpox. We didn't ask for a perfect presentation of a man just to get an articulate demogorgon. I'm just glad we didn't get a stringer prequel story with Aegis. I would have watched every second of it. <laughs> Be I tonight learned that this place has always sold wine and cocktails. <laughs> so I mean I don't drink, so this is of no real like practical importance to me, but it's just amazing to me that outside of everything Eric does, he's also like an efficient bartender. <laughs> um, this is the first I want to talk about Simba. I was actually hoping to read that <laughs> Because I'm interested in, because I think I align with it more than most, maybe. Uh, but I was wondering if you could touch on that for the people who have yet to, uh, to dive into the book. I mean, okay, so the, the title of the, of the essay, and this was something I originally wrote on the site um, that uh, got quite the bit of vitriol. Um, but the title of the essay is, it's time, to stop, it's time we stop pretending that Simba was a garbage of the light. And um, similar to my feelings about Stringer Bell, uh, my biggest thing that everyone's always like, dude, he was a kid, what was he supposed to do? Like, I learn. And like, I get that. Simba was never coming back, man. He was never coming back. He left his mom in that situation. He left Nala in that situation. He just turned his back on it. It had no worries, literally. Like, that's the thing. He was like, no worries. Like, yeah, no shit, no worries. When he just, like, forgot the people. It's my kid. And so, like, my biggest beef with Zumba is that, like, you know, I said this, I said this on another podcast, like, It'd be different if, like, The Lion King was a revenge story. Like, if, like, Simba, like, laid low and was, like, doing training in the jungle and shit, <laughs> like, and take pride rock I would feel different. But he just left, and it was just like, like, if someone was like, how's your mom doing? He's like, fuck if I know. <laughs> Simba was never going to do that. That's my biggest problem. That's my biggest problem. He, could, he just left the hood and was just like, well, yep, y'all figure it out. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, so one thing I would also like to suggest is that perhaps if one were I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, uh, but if one were to look at Lion King, the Lion King of the Lens of Conspiracy, it is is it not a little suspicious that Simba had an entire musical number about how he can't wait to be ten mere days before his dad was I mean, <laughs> I mean, I feel like this this to me speaks to if Simba was in on the conspiracy, you can't keep a secret for shit. <laughs> right? Like, like he, got, he might have got, he might have got the code. He was just like, man, you know, I got some bars. In the <laughs> like, I don't know where the inspiration came from. I don't know where the inspiration came from. Let me run this out. Jump over the grass edge. Grass edge, real quick, my little side. I mean, yeah, man. Mulan? I mean, Mulan's a goat. Mulan's a goat, right? Yeah. Mulan's a goat, right? Yeah, yeah. Mulan's a goat. And like, all, all our things is because in the book I literally have yeah. a ranking. Um, but like, Mulan, I mean, Mulan is up there, yeah. right? I mean, like, most of the Disney princesses. Mulan is apparently tall as hell. Okay, has anyone else seen this? If you Google how tall is Mulan, Mulan's at 7'6 or something. She like, play for the sky? <laughs> <laughs> And let's say it changed the rules, but I got, I got screenshots because every time I said it to people, I was like, yo, Moana big as hell. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question of scale in the film. Moana is like the tallest, would be the tallest player in either American basketball league. <laughs> Well, like, yeah, man, like, I don't, there's, there's so many characters that I would rather have my back than Simba. Like, I would take the mice from 
motherfuckers Cinderella. They, <laughs> they got Cinderella's back. They they rise to Cinderella. Cinderella rides to the fucking like out to the outskirts to hang out with two stoners. So not to like I don't know what you're gonna be about Cinderella, but just uh, let's gonna feel this out a little bit. If you both had an uncle, and I get that you were like some of the kids, but let's just let's for a minute assume that children. And you both, well, you're not a parent, but you've, you've fathered many poets who have stolen your stuff. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, no, you're like a little parent of a kid, like a, a grown child. So, <laughs> let's, assume, let's assume that we know and understand that like children have some capacity to reason. Yeah. Because, like, you know what's loud is? I used to, people used to, I mean, some of this shit ain't real. But people used to hop online all the time and be like, my kid said this this morning. And I used to be like, that shit ain't real. But then I was messing with Tyler and some kids and be like, hold up, wait a minute. That shit might be real. <laughs> <laughs> I was cynical until about five years ago. I was like, kids be saying some wild shit. <laughs> so let's assume that kids have to build a reason. If you two were children and had an uncle literally named Star who was surrounded by like fire every time he appeared, <laughs> is this the person you would like, <laughs> go to the house for? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's not a fan. Who doesn't like you? Like, I don't know, man. Like, okay, but, but like, to give some generosity, like, pops is not a right funny, right? And I talk about this in the book. Disney foul for that shit because if you go back and watch The Lion King, you just looking at the dead body in the box for like two minutes, man. <laughs> and I'm just like, no yeah, like, give my man a sheet or something. <laughs> <laughs> There is a little shock of like, like the, the wrong way, I get. Like, yo, you, you still can't even think it was your fault, you still got the kids. It was a little bit of his fault. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't like fully his fault. I mean, you, you out here doing dumb shit. <laughs> you out here trying to do hood rat shit with your friends, and then like, you know, you pop down. Like, that's, you gotta take some responsibility. All so, right. so, <laughs> right, right, I'll to a real one who But like, <laughs> so like, him running away, I get. But like, it's like, it's funny because somebody said this to me the other day, they're like, yo, so like, how do lions age? Like, how old, like, how much time actually passed before somebody passed that? <laughs> hey, is this, is this a dog year situation? Do we have anyone that knows how fast a lion age? I mean, they like seven years, like they're cats. <laughs> so like, so, like, so he should be able to turn a motherfucker by the time he's that big, right? Yeah. So, at some point, when someone wasn't literally having no worries all on, you know, some other continent and shit, wherever the hell you went. Like, at some point, you gotta be like, man, I don't think that shit was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up. Like, 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 I don't know, man, like, my mom get mad if I don't talk to her in a week. Like, he never felt any guilt about, like, not talking to his family or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, like, I mean, I know, I know you missed the past movie, but I'm going to give him my like, <laughs> So I, I got, I got a lot of problems with Simba, man. Like, the Lion King is, is the whatever, is a good story, I love the pasta. But like, Simba, Simba, the pasta. I like, I love the pasta, you got like 10 minutes of screen time. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was dead by the middle of the first half. It was like, the parts of them. The parts of the one. But well, that's nuts, because uh, there was a cartoon of like the lion guard and all like similar kids. Mufasa talks to the youngest kid no, all the time. He talks to him all the time. He don't answer the same one. He makes me know. What the hell did he do? You're cool. They were like, dad, no, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I got to say to you is going to be for right. right now. Your dad doesn't mind I'm talking to him. No, man, I'm talking to him. I told him the other kid I'm going to talk to his dad. That's why we're going to fight. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know we all had a boy that talked yeah. like, we all had one of them dudes. That like when you're out, he's the one that like got his chest pumped out and yeah. shit and like yeah. he's the one that got you in the fight. Yeah. You got me killed with the drop <laughs> What did I say to you? I'm good. From Monster Lula Beast Man? One of these number three is the one that killed okay. I mean, you. You got some of like gazelles or whatever, like their birds are drop. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I see like, oh, yeah. you got you got it. And that's the other thing, it's like at some point when somebody gets old enough, you gotta be like Damn man, I really fucked some shit up. I gotta, I gotta yeah, go, right. I gotta go clean some shit yeah, up. Yeah. And my dude was like, nope. nope. <laughs> like he be a D, he be buzz. He was like, he was like, you're gonna fry rock. He was like, who? Where? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I don't even have a pass 
travel, dude. I'm not. I'll travel like that, man. I'm good. What? Uh, okay, so it's gonna be hard for me to walk this because I have. But so, Omar, I love your person. I say, and it brought something to mind because recently I was talking to someone and I was like, well, you know, maybe someone will consider me a nerd because I know a lot about sports statistics and I know a lot about yeah. sneakers. And, and they're like, that doesn't count because those are like cool things. Those are like I social, know. quote unquote, socially acceptable things. And I was like, but how do we circle back to the point where comic books and other ephemera in that realm is also socially I mean, like, the MCU pretty much, like, owns my house. So, <laughs> at what point, like, how do you, how do you delineate, or how do you fight against the delineation of what one to be a nerd about versus what one Oh, I think it, because I was, I was that guy at, at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, the, we become a poetry background, right? So we used to be a thing called the Nerd Slam. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was hosting that one time, and I remember he was like, Jai. Jai was like, oh, let me get a sneaker head. I'm like, I don't got motherfuckers on the board. Yeah, they have a little, like, council. Like, I got motherfuckers that know about sneakers right here. <laughs> I was like, that's a cool thing. Now with age, I can be like, you know what? I was, I was wrong. And part of me, like, yo, I was wrong. It doesn't have to be like, I mean, even this cool would have read a point now in time where it's like, you are a fan of this thing. You know a lot about this thing. So you shouldn't be excluded because of that. And like, nerds, like, this mainstream, if we're at a point now where like, this mainstream, so what? Like, everything's like mainstream at this point now. So like, it's not even like a gatekeeping thing or anything. It's more like, it, it, the floodgates are open. Look, be, fucking, fucking, uh, Ben Affleck is Batman. Anything is fucking possible right now, all right? There are no rules anymore. There are no rules anymore. It's all fucking possible right now. So yeah, like, it's, you know sports, you know, it's like you are a fan of these things. So it's like really, not really a label for a person, it's more like, no, this is another label for a fan. Yeah. So this is yeah, what you're yeah. a fan of, so what, bring it all in, because it all fits on a spectrum somewhere, someplace. You know? I, I, I think of how, like, like, you can't, exactly what you said about the MCU, like, you can't be like, well, comic books. It's like, Mommy, don't you love, don't you love Thor? Is it just you? Like, I saw you crying when Mr. Stock, I can't fucking get it. Right, right, right. Like, now you go into your nerdy guys like, oh, this is, like, is that really happening in the comics, right? Yeah. So, like, you can't, like, if you're going and seeing, like, MCU films, you can't clown out comic books. That doesn't make any sense, right? That's the source material. And it's just like, yeah, and even more so the comics, like, high fantasy you used to get clowned, and then Game of Thrones happens, right? It's like, oh, you want to believe in Dragon's Battle, motherfucker? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I feel like because of the convergence of those popular media, it's, it's kind of forced those things into being very mainstream appeals, right? Where, where a lot of people, you know, I'm sure the MCU made a lot of comic book readers out of people, yeah. right? But there's still, there's still a ton of people that will go and see the next MCU film that comes out, and they're not going to go to a comic book store. And that's fine, but I don't see those people having, you know, a disregard for comics anymore because, like, literally, that's what that's what you're that's what you're indulging. And I think I think it was easy, especially like staying on the subject of like comic book films. They used to be terrible. It's yeah. always easier, you know, with like the Fantastic Four film. Oh, I have a Fantastic Four oh. question later. <laughs> 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 Wait, we used to be terrible movies. What movie made it okay? What movie made it great for everybody? It's Blade. Hell yeah! It was Blade. 1998, baby! Because, like, they're like, like, what's this? Like, what's this? Like, you know, like, that, that, that kind of makes it more, more palatable and more people can get on board. Um, that was a good way. And then, and then of course, you gotta give, like, Robert Downey Jr. credit, right? Because, like, Iron Man looked cool. And, and, and so it was, I remember, like in the 3Ds for Iron Man, I remember thinking, oh, it looks pretty cool. And I'm like, I, I, I had an affinity for it. But like, when I heard the reception, they were like, man, people are really like Iron Man. I was like, really? I was like, Iron Man? Like, B Star Marvel? He was like, I didn't know. Back then? That was, that was, but they, said, they did send it up to be like the big way. Every kind of movie comes yeah. out, they set him up, whatever. I mean, even before that, I always thought he was like a big, like, Iron Man Captain America. I was like, he's a fun player. But they, he was I, not on that level. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a surprise to me. So like, okay, so I have two questions, and one of them is practical, one of them is just my own curiosity. The practical one is that there's something about, because um, I see this, we see this talk about all the time where the people who are most invested in it don't have an exuberance about it without becoming gatekeepers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But because they're like, 
working there at, at the margins, at the cultural margins of America, uh, does that kind of create an impulse to be more generous? Because there is this thing where it's like, and I see it in sneaker culture, I see it in, I mean, I definitely see it in my years of music criticism, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, that's what, like, what, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll love to, like, the new high fidelity, but what annoyed me about it was the thing where it was playing on that old trope that the movie also played on, where it's like, these are fans all about exclusivity, and those yeah. who don't get in deserve to be rich. Yeah. Right? So, how do y'all uh, kind of circumvent that, and is it perhaps because you are, like, at the already at margins that people don't think you should that people don't think you belong? I think it's that part, and also, like, in picking up things on the spectrum, I think, I was. To be a nerd is a subculture, right? You may think there's a subculture. To be a black nerd is a subculture within a subculture. So once the nerd thing became popular, it's like, oh shit, that was my identity. I'm like, what? Like, for real, that was, that was my identity. Now your identity is cool, and you're, not, you're no longer the minority or whatever, or like shame for it or whatever. Who the fuck are you now? I think that's what, I think that's what gatekeeping uh, kind of stems from. Like, you're just trying to keep on this thing that was yours. And it was cool for everyone, like, you know, it was cool to you. Before it became cool to everybody, like, nah, you gotta let, you gotta let that shit go. You gotta let that shit go to grow, yo. This, this shit, this shit for everybody, man. This shit for everyone. I think, I look at it like, I think, yeah, like, we already started on the margins of that. And, and the whole reason that Black Hair Problems existed is because we just were like, we're not represented in this way. Um, especially, not, not even like, we're not represented in, you know, media, but we're like, we're not represented in the people that talk about yeah. it. Right, and, and so like our perspective isn't necessarily there, and that's kind of where our origin comes from. So I think we're already on the track of how can we bring more people into this thing, and and I think a lot of what defines nerd now, at least you know, in the sense that Omar and I embody, is like this enthusiasm for a thing that you want other people to be excited for yeah. as well, right? And so if we're being exclusionary in that, then it's kind of the thing, the purpose kind of goes against our natural instinct. And I just think of it like, you know, I think we all have that moment, right? Like, and an album comes out, right? And like, you listen to the whole album, and there's this one track on there that you're like, oh, this is my shit, and like, not many people are talking about it, right? I'm like, yes, right? yeah. And it's like, okay, this is my song. Yeah. Like, I love, I love this song. And then like, a music video gets made about it, and all of a sudden it was on it, and you're like, ah, oh, that was my shit. <laughs> Uh, and so, like, you can do one of two things. You can be like, yeah, I mean, you can be funny about it, like, yeah, yeah, you follow, you follow, yeah, you follow, follow, yeah, all right, yeah, I've been te- telling people yeah, about that shit, yeah. and now you know about it. Or you can be like, oh, man, I was on that shit before y'all, blah, 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 yeah. and now it's not fashionable anymore. Um, and I think they're, you know, not, not to get all Freud about it or whatever, but I think, you know, I think it stems from an insecurity, right? It stems from insecurity. And, like, I, I am, I could be much more charitable about this than I usually am, but I, I really do. It annoys the hell out of me when folks are like, I got bullied so much for the stuff, for the nerdy stuff I was into. Talk about and I'm like, it. And I'm like, talk about it. Did you get bullied for the stuff you were into? Or were you an asshole about the stuff you were into? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then like, um, I, I just kind of wonder about that. Um, and especially, especially, and this is weird, weird, very specific thing in, in the black nerd community where, like, dudes claim that, like, black girls weren't in until because they're the nerdy shit. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'm not going to you do that. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I don't know where you got from. So, like, I, I feel like it stems from an insecurity of, of a thing that you really adore. Um, that maybe it was not widely accepted at one point. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about gatekeeping, it happens on every level, but like just being real, frank about it, it happens, especially in the nerd, in the nerd circles, it happens to women, uh, more, 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 more yeah. anyone, um, it especially happens to, to, to queer folks, um, you know, being like, <laughs> people, people are having a real problem with the X-Men, because yeah. X-Men are super queer right now. Yeah. And like, oh, these are the X-Men. I'm like, oh, they don't want to do it. 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 They don't want to then if something's not sacred anymore because more people are into it, then like, obviously you had an unhealthy relationship to that piece of music. That's not true. 
<laughs> What's so Will, you might not have heard this, but a while ago, whenever we did that like WSD interview, that was like three years ago or something. Mm -hmm. You gave this great answer about like why the Fantastic Four films hadn't worked. And it was about how it's just like too, you know, the, there was a problem with pacing. Mm -hmm. Because there's just like too many backstories that they try to tell really yeah. robustly at once. Yeah. And it's like maybe you have to do this long ass boring movie with like four different origin stories. <laughs> and a villain origin story. And then like the last yeah, the last Fantastic Four movie was like a fucking Planet Earth documentary. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> and so, like the last five minutes. And it's like last five minutes, okay, kind of like, oh, right. yeah, it's just like, oh, this isn't good. Full <laughs> thing, yeah. It was wild because I was, I remember the first, uh, or the like first of this era, of the mm -hmm. last two ones. I was like, not much can get worse than that. And I saw the second one, and I was like, oh, man. I was wrong, I was wrong. I was really right. No. And so I wonder, like, what makes, if you see this, like, there since Star Wars with some of the characters, like, obviously, Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got the Chris Evans run. And what makes some of these things work versus if we're just thinking for, like, the broader MCU shit, what makes some characters stumble, like Spider-Man, where it's had so many Spider-Man. I know some of that people are like, got gotcha. aging out. Gotcha. Uh, but it's also been like a real struggle to nail down some some peripheral character. I think uh, it feels like what you're asking is how come Marvel's beating the shit out of DC right now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's the, it's the humanity level. The same thing that makes Spider-Man so great and why you like consider like you might consider Spider-Man the greatest of all time. I don't know. He's up there for me, but like it's that humanity level. Uh, when Tobey Maguire, let's just say this again, Tobey Maguire, I didn't like it because when he had the mask on, there were no jokes. Yeah. Andrew Garfield, I thought he was cool, but he, see, he came out kind of dickish uh, when the mask was on. But I think he did the job right. Tom Holland is the perfect, uh, yeah, perfect. is the perfect blend of humor and um, humor and empathy and all the uh, all the other shit that makes up Peter Parker. Right, he's great. So a lot of other Marvel uh, movies have that humor as well, but not take themselves too seriously. As well, um, and I think that's what kind of separates it and makes the casting good. Also, these are like these are casting people that like were really well known uh, at the time. Now, now they cast everybody. Was unknown yeah. for you know. Um, Chris Evans had done. Chris Evans had done. Chris Evans was good. He was a bad thing. He was a bad. You see the movie? He was a Scott Pilgrim. Uh, he had a role. Uh, he never Scott Pilgrim. But he was also in Fantastic Four. Yeah. Listen, we don't talk about Fantastic Four. You know, we we don't we don't we don't. Yeah. We don't, we don't, we don't <laughs> There's a there's a hilarious meme about like a fictional conversation happening between yes. Michael B. Jordan yes. and Simon. It's like <laughs> I found myself stuck in this terrible franchise with my dude. It's like, alright, we're well, gonna hit the gym, get ready. Go back to you, right? Um and so uh for, to me, I think and I think it's a lot that you know, one of the things that the MCU has done, um Weirdly, you know, I think it's, you know, my criticism has got a pretty point right like, away. But, um, you know, we're, we're all writers up here, and we're all writers who um, imbue a, a great deal of our own personal experience into our writing, right, in some aspect. And, you know, what they'll, the most stereotypical thing that they'll say in a workshop or, or, or a panel talk is like, Finding the heat of where, yeah. of, of, of where in that writing, right? Where's the heart of that writing? Where's the, what's, where's the motor, right? Propelling that piece of writing forward. And I think that one of the reasons the MCU has been successful is that it's kind of been able to find that some of its biggest films, right? Like, where's the actual heart of the story you're telling? And, and that, and in that way, they don't always have to do an origin story, right? Like that Fantastic yeah. Four, we gotta hear about the backgrounds of like, Five different people, um, all while they're trying to move the plot along, right? And like, because we've been familiar with all these characters for a while, even when you see, you know, when Tom Holland's Spider Man, we, we see him in a film that's not his own at first. But like, Spider Man is not a, that's not a origin. Like, Uncle Ben already dead, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, so, and they were, and they were very aware that like, we have to tell the story that showcases the heart of Peter Parker, why he's your friendly neighbor Spider-Man. His uncle passing away and all the circumstances are not as important as that, mm -hmm. right? And I think so many early comic book films were so just chained to we have to tell the story of how this person became a hero when it may not have been the most interesting aspect 
of them. And obviously, if you did that when they were first starting out with a lot of those characters, like, you know, Iron Man, most famously, had an origin story. Um, but they got very comfortable of uh, just being like, what's the actual story we're trying to tell and what's important to this? And, like, we can trim the excess um, from a lot of the trappings that have to come with these comic books. Meanwhile, Batman's parents dying. I was about to say, we must see Marcus Clark the way his pearls got like eight times on I remember. Because the site is still up, you probably will find it. I think it was online Grand One, where someone did a ranking. A ranking where they counted down of the best scenes in which the Waynes got murdered. It was hilarious. If it's like two I feel like in the in the in the Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie it happened again. <laughs> I was like, oh man, this isn't even a Batman movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, in the, in the Joker movie they did the like framing of it, I was like, oh, we don't have to do this, come on, man. <laughs> like, for, I didn't like the Joker movie, I'm sorry, but I was like, this is bad enough, like I've been in this theater for two hours, I'm ready to go home. Yeah, like, we don't gotta kill his pants. Man, ain't getting nothing wrong here. <laughs> 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 Because, like, I guess now, you know, Batman has the most famous origin story of any comic book character. And it's not because it was particularly memorable because of how it happened, but because they have to, they feel compelled to show it every single time they introduce a Batman. Uh, and, you know, I'm just, I, I, I hope that they can take some of the lessons of this generation of, of particular comic book films, especially on the MCU side, where it's just like, we trust you to give us the story in the years, right? Like, like, we know how that... ...during the new in The Batman that's coming out. But, like, isn't, 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 isn't the simple, like, yeah, hey, from the gun it. that killed his parents? I'm just like... Uh, like, yeah, that's saying, like as, we're just changing that, man. As an emo, you know, like, I'm an emo dude. I saw that and I was like, damn. <laughs> Emotional as it gets, but settle down. <laughs> Damn, Bruce! Yeah, <laughs> let it go, Bruce! Talk to the therapist. Look, I mean, look, look, and that's like you know, our, our, our homie, uh, Brittany Williams, always makes this point. She's like, the, the superhero world needs therapy so yeah. bad. <laughs> these therapy so bad, like so many stories, but not to fruition, and these folks just sit on the couch and talk to somebody, man, and like, just, just, just once a week. We know you gotta save people. Just like, <laughs> talk about a Thursday afternoon, man. Like, do something. Um, but Batman probably, perhaps more than anybody else, needs some real, some real therapy. For the, for the writing of the book, what was the kind of collaborative process? Because this is almost like a, like a watch the throny kind of double. <laughs> watch the throny! <laughs> what was your kind of like? We all send each other stuff, or we all in one Google Doc, like how did the writing go? Or was it just a compilation of, or I know some of this stuff was on the site, so it was just like, what do we pick, what do we put in here, how do we order it? I think for the, uh, for the, we knew we were going in for, have we met before for, for the site stuff? I think, I believe we already had the site stuff picked out. We both wrote 20 new essays each, right? And we're like, I will take 10 from the best, and we both sides put it in. It was funny, because like, I thought it was going to be like, more I'm like, COVID and, and like, work and shit, right? So, like, it really felt like Will was out in the West, not in the tunnel, I'm over in Tibet, right? And <laughs> shit, and like, for real, it's like, we're just like, right, 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 right. And then at one point, I was like, it's hard to write funny right now. And yeah. then, like, it was like, it's really hard to write funny. And then it was like, it was like, second for one point, and then, uh, I was like, so we gotta go, like, meet up or something. And Will was like, hey, man, we just, like, meet up in a rent in, in a fucking city. And so he was like, just work on this together. And, uh, Will was like, that's what it does. That was a big turning point. It was like, oh, it just felt like really, really good then. So then we were in person, I'm like, okay, here's what I've been working on. Here's what, uh, here's what you've been working on. All right, cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, maybe we can say this with us cutting the floor, whatever. Oh, we can, you can expand that. So it was like, it was really good. It was really good. I mean, I can say this now, uh, because the book is finished and, and we have a pretty smooth process. I wasn't right shit. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I keep finding out new things when we get 
Yeah. 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 Just to touch base, okay, I'm going to bounce some ideas on each other, but I see what we got so far. Uh, we really did, for two people that did not live in the same city, we were going to spend a lot of this time working on this in person, together. Um, and that was like, if, if, if we didn't, I mean, to be honest, if we thought we weren't going to be able to do that, I don't know that we would have done this, right? Um, and so, they hope happens. And it still happens. And, uh, all of a sudden, that's not really an option. And at the time, too, you know, I'm, I'm going through grad school, and so I'm making sure that I'm meeting those obligations. And I was like, I'd be doing my grad school stuff, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, I gotta write for the book. And I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just like, I was like, okay, I guess I'll go back and edit something. <laughs> <laughs> it was not, it was not part of the book. And so that's when, when Omar and I were talking, to, like, I remember saying this to my wife, I was like, hey, you cool if I just, I'm just gonna go meet Omar in the city for like a weekend. And she's like, you okay? I was like, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said to Omar, I was like, yo, can we like, you know, we just like meet the city. I was like, oh, you know, Omar's coming from New York, we're coming from here, obviously. I'm like, can we just like meet in DC or something? Something's gonna be easy for us to get in and out of or whatever. Um, like, do you see what you to be In this perspective, it was. Like, we just, like, we picked, like, a hotel that was not, like, in a populated area or whatever, just, like, boom, boom. And so, um, yeah, so we just met that weekend, and, like, we spent, like, at least, like, two days in the hotel, just kind of, like, bouncing some of our ideas. Okay, what do we actually have? What do we want to include here? What are you working on? What's finished? That kind of thing. And we just, we could have done that remotely, but like it was so much more organic and, and, and quick and, and, and cohesive uh, when we met together. And then like we had new ideas that we that we were gonna pop literally the the uh the Springer Bell was like essay was a thing that was like just kind of brimming in my head and I kind of ransomized my home I almost like yeah go there. Yeah, yeah. Um and so we had a few of those moments. And I came home from DC and my wife was like, How you doing? I was like, I feel so much better. <laughs> I feel so much better. <laughs> and then I wrote, because I wanna write shit. I wanna write the damn thing. Yeah, um, told me. And then and then I and then I came home and wrote my episode. So, you know, that's the problem. No no hurt, no hurt. Meanwhile, my life's been real. Hey, what's going on here? I can't disappoint Will, get out of here. I'm not gonna be the quick look at this person. It takes it a wall and she's like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to see that. So like it was it was collaborative in that aspect and then and then I like that Will Stanley look. I'm glad he did that. And so yeah, like it, 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 so it was hugely collaborative in that aspect. And I think it was very collaborative from the fact that like we felt good that we had like quote unquote more than enough, right? Like we had a lot of we had a lot of work that could have went in and we were like, okay. What needs to be here? What you know? Are there some gaps, whether tonally or subject matter wise, that we need to fill? Um, and we could talk through that. So yeah, it was it was a collaborative all the way through. You know, regardless if they were individual essays or not. All right. So this is the last thing because I know we have up against the clock, and I feel like this could go on a bit. <laughs> is is there any Disney villain who actually doesn't have a point? <laughs> yeah, like, so you think of, okay, so first of all, right? Not really, man. Uh, not really, I mean. He not cares about every villain, surely. But some, but like less panels, maybe, and more like her slug and little mermaid, yes. Because I feel like she mostly was mad that her contract was broken. Oh, I <laughs> Uh, we got someone, um, we got someone Tiffany on the site that's been doing like uh, like a, a little bit like 
two videos like a series, but like, you know, these were justified Disney villains. And like, Ursula like, did nothing wrong. Did nothing wrong? I mean, I mean, I mean, in the sense of like, Jimmy Jones, like, you know, like, I'm like, this is this is not here. Let me put you more. Yeah, like, all right, yeah. All right, you got to take your man, like, I was in the contract, that's good. Like, we can stretch the definition of nothing wrong. Okay. But, I will say that she did lay out the terms of the contract, like, really clearly. And so I think about this because I've been rewatching Disney movies in a bit, like here and there and everything that I've always been working. I'm like, oh, like most of these villains, even even Scar mm -hmm. was really all about some like Scar got passed over. Yeah, he's trying to like a little bit. Well, okay. So now I'm thinking about this. Scar also is kind of bad, but but I think at the core, I mean, he passed over for a reason. Yes, Scar was like trying to uplift the working class. Ain't got his ass beat. Ain't got and, and literally got Scar for it. Like yeah, you know, like. I would feel some kind of way. Imagine trying to uplift the, up the, the word class and getting ass beat. I mean, like, <laughs> clearly, many many people can. Uh, classic story in America. But, I, you know, I don't think Star was all that. Uh, is, I guess the message is there a Disney villain who you're just entirely against? Who, who's like your deal? Maybe like Gaston? I'm not really a. Okay, yeah. There's some theories that Gaston was actually the hero of them. Like, no, are, you no, like, are you kind of a misogyny or not? I mean, Beast, to be fair, Beast was also bad. Like, it's the best of situation. He had a whole woman trapped in a castle, so <laughs> like, oh, so Stop! Like, damn, we got an angry if you were trying to care. Like, you want to be like that? Like, 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 for the guy who had a woman, like, locked in a castle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, like, look, I mean, I mean, we're having fun with it, and I don't want to, like, go so, you know, but, like, what's the culture that I was raising? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
like inherited some shit. You know what I'm saying? You know, like, yo, I can actually do the job, but like, your daddy was born to a different family, so yeah. like, you got the job. We all been there. Jafar also like six nine. So if you get him, <laughs> if you get him around on the front line, it, that'll be like some late nineties spring shit. He could have got all that shit. He could have got off the hood. He could have just fucking hoop. There was no place to hoop with the father. I got politics shit. I got fucking politics and shit. I'm just saying, for Jafar. Look, man, he's just like, and, and that was his life. There was no other way. It's not like Jafar wasn't gonna work himself up out of that position, uh, right? You know what I'm saying? He gonna he gonna die in advisor. But dude, like, no, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make moves. You gotta make some moves. That's a ball. You gotta make some moves. <laughs> All right, uh, I know we're time. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Like maybe one or two about anything Disney related or not? How do you feel about Ariel? <laughs> oh my gosh. Ariel's and Ariel just needed some guidance, perhaps. Yeah. She needed somebody to say, listen. Stop out here, take the mess. Yeah. We must have, like, oh, like, I signed, back before I, like, had an agent, I would have signed any contract. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, they didn't want to say, like, I don't even know what it was there. They would have been like, here, just sign this. I would like, I mean, it seems all right. <laughs> so I kind of sympathize with Ariel because I think she was just like, I can do what? <laughs> If it won't cost me nothing now, I'm in. Yo, everybody. It was like a payday loan. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, Ariel was bored as hell, dude. Yeah. Ariel was bored as hell. She didn't know her dad is in spicy as hell, right? She was like breaking contacts and shit. Sebastian sang that long ass song about the virtues of MSC and Ariel was like, ain't none of that shit. Fuck all this. It's like, that real bullshit. Yeah. Thank you for the tune, but that shit ain't for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you're trying to walk out this shit. Fuck <laughs> it. Like, you're, you're a crab, so you dedicated this. I'm trying to get you back, bro. Shit was going crazy. 
Uh, it was during, the, during the whole war going on, man. John Stewart had this great scene where he's looking for a sniper three galaxies away, and he forms a sniper rifle because he's being the Marine. And he's like, all right, where are you? Where are you? I saw that. I'm like, this is some cold shit. I go, to, I go, to, I'm telling my mom about it, right? So I'm following her around the house. I'm like, no, 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 you gotta look at this. He forms a. The Marine works this way because they, that's what they think about. If he goes to the bathroom, I'm like, so yeah, he said, oh, well, I'm in the bathroom. I'm like, oh. So then I slide the comic book underneath the door. I'm like, if you look at page five right there, right? This is, you got this thing, shit's crazy, right? So it, it's that enthusiasm and one like shared. Like, I, I, I have to share this with someone. Which was my mom's the only other one in the house. So. My mom was really just trying to get some problems. Yeah, I was like, no. No, she's popping all over. She's popping right now. Just like, okay. All three of us would do that to him for some reason. Never see that piece, like, no, 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 you can't pour it down together. Maybe one last question if you guys got one. Going once, going twice. Alright, thanks, y'all. Thanks for looking at me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.